Hello, everyone, and welcome to Let's Talk Cafe. We've got Emily Draycott Jones joining us. Hey, Emily, how are you doing? Super. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Emily is joining us all the way from Singapore. And today she's going to talk about her midlife crisis and the importance of having your tribe. So, guys, before we um, talk to Emily, I just want to explain a little bit about, about Let's Talk and Let's Talk Cafe. So Let's Talk uh, is, is a, a program, a, a movement, if you want to call it, and it's two acronyms just to make things easy for you. L-E-T-S, letting everyone talk safely, which is really the, the vision of the program to encourage people to talk about uh, their, their concerns before they escalate to big issues, including mental uh, health or even, even suicide. And when we uh, uh, have a let's talk with a, with a cup of coffee like this, Are you got your uh, coffee there, I Emily? Do, I do have my two in one. And, and guess what? I've got, I found some Kim Tams. <laughs> We've okay, got Let's Talk me. Cafe. Fantastic. So uh, talk uh, is the four strategies of the program, T-A-L-K, which is tell, acknowledge, listen, keep in touch. And we're going to go through those strategies while we talk to Emily today. Tell is about seeing the telltale signs and, 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 and asking the person. And then when they open up is to acknowledge them, not uh, advice or not talk about your story, but to acknowledge them in the, in the, in the first instance, then listen, L for listen, and then K for uh, keep in touch. So I want to introduce uh, Emily to you. Now, Emily is a, a HR professional, a mom, a mom of twins, a wife, daughter, friend, neighbor, <laughs> employer, breadwinner. Wow. Hey, Emily, I'm sure that every single one of these titles uh, at one point or another, uh, would seem like a full-time job, right? Most certainly does from time to time. Now, Emily uh, professionally is an international HR director for a global technology firm and also has her own consultancy uh, business offering HR uh, advice and, and training uh, to international clients. Now, after almost 20 years of climbing up and down the corporate ladder, Four uh, years ago, Emily felt sad. She felt bored and she felt anxious, but couldn't work out why. Uh, she had a great job. She had a, a great husband and friends, great kids, um, supportive parents and a, and a great life in Singapore. Um, it took her two years uh, and a lot of talking to work out that having goals and achievements in life is not the same as having meaning and purpose. So uh, she set upon a journey to self-discovery and today she's going to share her story about her midlife crisis and the importance of having a tribe for support. Um, Emily, welcome and thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much and I'm so excited I'm able to do it despite not being able to meet up with you in a cafe. We both seem to have similar taste in uh, in garden views. I so, know, so uh, tell us where, yeah, where, where are you sitting at the moment? You're at home? Yes, I'm, I'm in my home with my cup of coffee. So Singapore, we still have to wear masks everywhere we go out. So I think yeah. this would be a little bit nicer uh, for both of us. Um, I'm sat in my back garden. This is a, a Bucket Batok Town Park, otherwise known nice. as Kugwe Lin. So we're right. in the kind of northwest of Singapore. Fantastic. Now, I actually worked in Malaysia for a couple of years and I used to come to Singapore for work as well. Such a beautiful place. Amazing. And when you said, uh, I've, got a, I've got lots of greenery in the back, I thought, oh my gosh, Singapore greenery, you just can't compare to... Uh, I guess to Melbourne uh, and I thought oh, I better show off my backyard so I'm actually at home as well. <laughs> I know it's and, fantastic it's beautiful. Yeah so behind behind us so uh, this is our house uh, I'm sort of stand, uh, sitting in in a bit of a uh, balcony uh, area and uh, we are we're really fortunate to have uh, like a creek behind our house so backing onto a creek and there's a beautiful bike track and, and walking track and some some water and some ducks so we're very very fortunate. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in Melbourne. It's not too hot um, and, and the birds are singing, so it's wonderful. Hey, Emily, uh, 
let's talk about midlife crisis. Now, midlife crisis happens, right? <laughs> However, uh, I don't see many people really talking about it or in depth anyway. Um, when did you first notice the telltale signs, you know, for you and, and what was it like? So it's an, it's an interesting one and I don't want to kind of downplay yeah. what other people go through. And I, I speak about my midlife crisis in a, in a jovial, very open and, and, you know, hopefully sometimes humorous way. Yeah. Um, I've tried not to take it too seriously because, um, you know, I want to encourage people to talk about it and I, I enjoy talking about it. And, you know, I don't sometimes want the conversation to get deep and, and meaningful because then, you know, it detracts from yeah. just getting people to open up. And I know that some people suffer way more than I have, you know, and, and, and part of my midlife crisis has been actually appreciating how much I have yeah and and in some ways feeling guilty for feeling sad um and you know in in preparation for our conversation i've been having a think about it and i and i guess part of it it, it comes from even before four years ago it comes from you know i i've always been one of these people that says they thrive in pressured environments right and i I look out for that now when I'm, I'm talking to people in my HR career, I'm like, you say you thrive in pressure environments? It's like, that's an early warning signal for me, right? Yeah. Who on earth wants to thrive under pressure? I mean, you know, a, a little bit of adrenaline is great and we all need it from time to time, but like, who wants that to be the driving force behind their performance at work? Yeah. Um, I think for me, it, it definitely started when I had the twins which, mm -hmm. and they're eight now. Okay. Um, and that maternal anxiety, the, the, the sheer panic of looking at my children and going, oh my God, I'm now responsible for keeping these things alive. Like, what <laughs> the hell? Like, how did that happen? I would sometimes look at them and just turn around to my husband and just say, how, how did that? I know how it happened, but like, how did that happen? Um, and you know, I, there were these bouts or these periods where I would have, you know, really high levels of anxiety about that. Yeah. Um, and I guess, you know, thinking back, so when did I start acknowledging that my thriving under pressure or my, my anxiety, parental anxiety, whatever it is, my midlife crisis, whatever we want to call it, I guess the first instance for me was the children were a couple of years old and we were on a um, cable car. I don't remember where we were. We were with my parents and we were on this cable car somewhere in, in Singapore. Spain. I remember, no, no, no. Everybody was speaking Spanish. So it was right. definitely some, somewhere in Spain, maybe Tenerife, somewhere like that. I was living in Europe at the time. And um, I remember being on this cable car and my mom saying to the boy, don't lean on the windows. It's really dangerous. Um, and then it was almost like the room just carried on, but I was in a parallel universe and I saw my son fall out of this cable car into the woods underneath. And I felt the panic of having to continue on this cable car until we got to the end. You know, it's not like you can jump out. Yeah. You know, you have to continue to the end. And then I felt the panic of all of these people speaking in Spanish and me trying to explain to them that my son had fallen out. And, and I lived it. I lived it. And, and, and I remember, you know, my, my husband or it might be my dad kind of going, you okay? And I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 I'm fine. You know, and then just carrying on my day. And, you know, us having this conversation or, or preparing for this conversation, I kind of realized that was the first time if I now think about it, it was probably an anxiety attack. Yeah. So um, it was a trigger kind of thing. Yeah. And, but I, I kind of overlooked it and just put it down to, you know, general stress. There was, uh, you know, I, I do work. I've always worked in kind of high pressure HR jobs, you know, lots of M&A activity, 
uh, you know, lots of, um, you know, redundancy situations, lots of yeah. big hiring, opening new offices, that kind of thing. I've never taken a kind of boring job. Um, and I just kind of put it down to that. And it was about the same time that we were having a lot of terrorist attacks in Europe. I was traveling a lot. You know, I used to get really worried about, you know, being being trapped overseas and not able to get back to, to the kids. Yeah. And all that kind of stuff but that was like the first really big and and you know preparing for this conversation today that was like the first really big moment i can remember where i went hey that that's not normal that's not okay yeah no yeah so so, so then you know it progressed to feeling sad how did that happen how, how, how did yeah, that so... sad and having that constant anxiety or or, or periods of anxiety? So we, we moved to Singapore. The children were about three. Yes. Um, and I was definitely much happier when we moved to Singapore. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't have the anxiety of all of the terrorist attacks going on in Europe. Um, my husband, it, who is just a godsend, um, gave up his career to, to kind of support mine by moving to Singapore and he was at home with the children. So even when I was traveling, um, I, I didn't worry about the kids. I knew they had their dad and they were absolutely yeah. fine. Um, and, and I guess in Singapore, you live in a, I refer to it as my bubble of happiness, right? <laughs> and you kind of block out the outside world. There's not as much frequent news broadcasting and all that kind of stuff, like in all the misery of Europe. Um, and I, I had an amazing life. I had an amazing job. Uh, I had an amazing friends, amazing colleagues. Uh, we were very fortunate that, you know, quite soon after moving to Singapore, we got our permanent residency. So we didn't even have to worry about immigration issues. Yeah. Um, and yet I, I kind of felt unfulfilled. Okay. Um, and I remember having, you know, very early when we when we came to Singapore, I, I was just so busy with getting used to our new life that I didn't really acknowledge the fact that I'd kind of achieved my life goals. Yeah. You know, I had a great husband. I had great kids. My parents were doing fine uh, back in the UK. They were visiting us um, often, and that was working out really well. We had a beautiful yeah. home. Uh, we're fortunate here in Singapore. We're blessed that that we have helpers and we had an amazing helper who loved the children dearly and, and became and, and is very much part of the family. Um, I also with a with a friend of mine set up a, a network. I, I very quickly realized that I didn't fit into the normal expat wives group here. Yeah. Um, because I was the breadwinner and, and my husband was the stay at home dad. Yeah. Um, and so myself and another lady I'd, I'd met in a similar situation, we set up uh, a network for breadwinning expat ladies. Yeah. And so very, very early on, you know, maybe after a year of being here, I had this amazing group of really powerful kick-ass women. Yeah. Um, and we talked about all the things that, that I felt that I'd always felt I could never acknowledge, you know, we, I hate the term imposter syndrome, but you know, women, do experience it. We talked about diversity at work. We talked about being the only woman in the room. We talked about early signs of, of you know, menopause, perimenopausal symptoms. You know, we talked about all of this stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and, and having this great pool of people around me. And yet I still felt really unsatisfied. And yeah. I felt so guilty for feeling unsatisfied. So I didn't yeah. talk about it. Um, you know, my husband would refer to it from time to time as, oh, you know, you, you always need something to worry about. So if it wasn't, um, if it wasn't work, it would be our permanent residency application. If it wasn't permanent residency application, I'd be worried about my parents' next visit. Yeah. If it wasn't that, I'd then be worried about, um, you know, what school the kids are going to go to and are the kids happy? Yeah. And if I wasn't worried about that, I'd be worried about a friend or like, he, he jokes that, you know, as soon as I don't have something to worry about, I look for stuff. Yeah. Um, and I suppose that manifested itself in this just constantly feeling this sense of discontent. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
and feeling really stupid for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> because, I, I guess you, you, you yeah. probably haven't felt like that. It was some, a new experience for you. When did you label it? And I, you know, I, I sort of use that term uh, lightly. When did you think it was this thing called midlife crisis? Like, when did you sort of acknowledge that? So very, very vividly, I remember sitting in, um, there's, a, there's a lovely bunch of bars. <laughs> Most of my conversations normally happen in a bar. Um, it's a good place to have it. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember sitting with a girlfriend who is in very similar circumstances to me. She has two kids, not twins, but she has two yeah, kids. Yeah. Uh, she's a breadwinning expat here, here in Singapore. She's moved back to, to, uh, to Switzerland now, but, um, you know, breadwinning expat, works in HR, really su successful in her career. And yeah, hers comes out as like this constantly angry, right? She's always angry at something. I felt sad. Yeah. She felt angry. Yeah. And we started talking about it. And I, I don't remember how the conversation comes up, but we were sat in this bar just off Orchard Road. And we were having this conversation and, and by having this conversation with each other, we kind of just realized that we'd achieved all our goals. Yeah. And. Pro professional we were, goals. Yeah, I guess professional goals, life goals. You know, we have two yeah. kids. We both have a boy girl, like the, the perfect package. Yeah. Uh, we have a, you know, great relationships. We have some money in the bank. We live in nice homes. Our parents are all well and healthy. This yeah. is before before any of us had to worry about COVID. Um, you know, so, so we were sat there and we had this conversation and we both realized, oh my God, we have no goals left. Um, and, you know, because, because normally, I guess you go through your life sitting, setting your objectives, right? Yeah. You, you yeah. know, the, the typical HR interview question is, where do you see yourself in five years? You know, yeah. I, I guess if, if I'd ever set goals for myself, my answer would have always been, oh, I want to live in paradise. I want to get paid for traveling the world. Um, I want, I, I want a, a happy family. I want my parents to be able to visit me. I want to live in the sunshine. I want yeah. my kids to go to a local school and speak Chinese. And, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm myself and my friends, we sat there going, oh my God, we've done it. Like we, we've basically done life. And, and the reason we both feel, or I felt sad and she felt a little bit angry and, and frustrated, yes. because we weren't striving towards anything anymore. It was yeah. more about, okay, where's the next holiday to be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, when are my parents visiting for the next time? Yeah. Um, you know, getting through milestones at work, I guess, the next cycle of performance reviews, the next yeah. big project rollout. Um, and we both just realized life was life was amazing, but yeah. it's really dull if you don't have goals. And I yeah. and I guess, yeah, maybe that's what happens when you get to that point in your career, you know, that kind of early 40s, maybe. Yeah. And and you kind of have reached the level you want to reach. Yeah. Um and then you suddenly, I guess, just get, so you know, so so what's the meaning of life? And, yeah, and yeah. It, it sounds it sounds like a really, really big question, but I guess that's what it comes down to. Why are we here? You know, and, and, and people would, I guess, have conversations around success and legacy. And, you know, I was still feeling like, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, you know, like I'm still, I've still not worked out who I am yet. How can I be 40 with two kids and responsibilities and a great career when, yeah. Like uh, yeah, and it all just manifested itself into this this yeah. big so did you feel like you were, for me. Did you feel like you were kind of on autopilot up to that point, and then all of a sudden you've sort of woken up and going, "What? What am I? What am I here for?" Kind of thing. Yeah, I, I. It was definitely this lacking of meaning and purpose, and sure. you know, I'm I'm very grateful that I never had dark thoughts. You know, I, I never went down that path. I don't consider that I've ever struggled with, with I guess, mental illness, you know, yeah. if you talk about it like that. Um, for me, and now looking back over, I guess, the last four years and, and more in detail, looking at where it stems from and maybe the last eight years, Yeah. you know, 
uh, it's definitely for me just being around general anxiety. Yeah, I, I guess is is how I would frame it. Sure. Um, and that I can I can always find something to be anxious about. Always. Yeah. You know, even when life's perfect, I'm never just content. Sure. And, and that not being content, I think, is for me manifestation i guess is the word of, of my midlife crisis just not being content not not sitting in the moment with meaning and purpose and enjoyment and fulfillment yeah. and fulfillment yeah so so emily um it got to got to a point where um mm. you did go and see a counselor did you go and end up seeing a counselor i did and it was, was it like? was the same friend i guess um you know, through my tribe, and I, I talk about the importance of tribe, you know, having now got to this point, you know, maybe four years ago, where I realized that I I was struggling or I, I was, you know, sad yeah. uh, and frustrated and, and, and not having meaning. Um, for about two years, I just went on a journey of having conversations with people and having really open dialogue, especially with other women, um, you know, and, and talking about hormonal changes and parental feelings and how your relationship changes with, with your partner after you've had children. And yeah. through a series of conversations with lots of people that I consider in my tribe, these people that I trust that, you know, have similar life experiences to me. Um, it took me about two years to actually go, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm now not going to just talk to people in my tribe. I'm going to go and talk to somebody whose job it is to listen to me yeah. um, and, and not just kind of have conversations over wine. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it was the same friend that encouraged me to do that, uh, which, which I did. Um, what I, was it like? I, guess, I guess I struggled with the yeah. idea of going and seeing a counselor because like I, I'm, I'm a psychologist by trade, right? I, I um, well, by, at least by education, I did a psychology yeah. degree. Um, I guess working in HR, I'm very, very good at, at listening to others and seeing people through their career crises <laughs> and, you know, talking to people through, through their problems. And I've always been that person that, that people kind of rely on. And so I, yeah, it took me two years to acknowledge, you know, maybe it'd be really useful to go and actually talk to somebody that's paid to listen to me. Yeah. 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 Um, and just on, on that, just before we get into acknowledge, um, the first strategy of Let's Talk, and, and you know the program because your workplace um, did the program. You're, you know, we just finished a, a, a bunch of uh, uh, wonderful staff who went through the program. Um, seeing those telltale signs. Now, in your case, the telltale signs was probably different to, to your friends, right? And, and, and I guess everyone has different types of telltale signs. But looking back now, um, what was important for you looking back to look at those telltale signs and, you know, could you have not waited two years? Do you know what I mean? Looking back, what, what's your thoughts about that? Um, so I think there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff women don't talk about <laughs> in terms of, you know, body changes, hormone changes, yeah. um, physiological psychological changes that kind of happen and I, I you know i know it happens to men as well I, I i don't know as much about that but definitely with women and and women don't talk about it uh you know i think there's this misconception that women are really open and we talk to each other about everything you know the reality is we kind of don't yeah um, but when it gets really like deep and meaningful um uh, there's always still a sense of, you know, your propriety and, and you know, I'm, I'm British, you know, we have the stiff upper lip, we don't talk about that stuff. Um, but I, I guess what happened for me was the more I 
consciously made a decision to tell people what I was going through. Yeah. I went through a bunch of medical tests, um, you know, to, just to check out what was going on with my hormones. And, and um, you know, I, I went to see an endocrinologist and, and, and got a whole lot of test results. And through my little breadwinning expat group, you know, I started to talk to other people about some of my, yeah. um, you know, results, etc. And then other people would say, oh my God, I, I have that too, you mm. know? And then, you know, the hot flushes thing that kind of comes yeah. and starts to get perimenopausal. And I just thought it was living in Singapore, right? It's hot here, you know, but I would talk to friends. They go, oh my God, I have that too. And, yeah. and, and then I guess that the number of, oh my God, that happens to me too. That for me was then all of these telltale signs that yeah. what I was going through was something that loads of people go through and it's okay it's not just me being a bit weird and it's not just me being a little bit you know um you know looking for things to be anxious about that yeah. actually it's a thing right and, it and, happens. It yeah. and it probably has a label and a name and there's probably something that somebody can do to help me with it absolutely um, but it took me a really really long time and an awful lot of oh god me too's yes um for me to just go okay I, I'll, I'll, then it's okay for me to go and talk to somebody about it because it's probably got yeah. a label and it's probably got a cure. Yeah. So in um, terms of family, your husband, your kids, um, did they notice the telephone signs and did they approach you and ask about <laughs> So my, my husband is the most politically incorrect person and, and with very dark sense of humor also, which, um, which, which helps greatly. Um, hey, he's a great guy. He made you a cup of coffee. Was it coffee? He did. He made me a cup of coffee. He made me a cup of coffee and set my computer <laughs> up. Um, honestly, he's. I. I don't want to. I. I don't want to. You know. Um, sing his praises too much because his head will get big. But uh, no, he's. He's amazing. He's been through me through an awful lot with me. We met. Um, we met when I'd actually just gone through um, one of many redundancies. Uh, I work in HR, right? So I'm always making myself redundant. But I, I'd gone through a redundancy. I was just about to move to Russia. Again, another one of my random decisions to go and find something exciting to do. Yeah. Um, and then I ended up not moving to Russia or moving to Singapore for the first time. This is the second time I've lived in Singapore. So he was back in the UK and I was here. Um, and, and I guess he always acknowledged the fact that I was a bit weird. Yeah. Um, he's always acknowledged the fact that there's some harebrained idea or scheme that I've got that, you know, I can't do anything simply, calmly, and with contentment. Um, he's, he said to me, we've been together for maybe 11 years now. And, and you know, looking back, the, there's a constant theme of the things he says to me, right? It's, oh my God, you've always got to have something to worry about. Um, why can't you just be content? Why can't you just be happy? Um, and so I, I guess he's always recognized it in me, probably more than I have and, and probably way before I did. Um, and, and, and he tolerates my weirdness, which is great. Yeah. My kids, I guess, as they got older, I just became increasingly aware of my behavior around them yeah um it became much easier once we moved to singapore it, it's much easier to be happy here for me to be honest um you know the the sun is shining and and you know we have great help with the kids and if it means i want to sleep all morning on a saturday um yeah. <laughs> you know the, there's other people to take them to the park and whatever so i've um yeah i yeah, th there was not really necessarily anybody coming to me saying, oh, I think you have a problem. Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, hindsight's a wonderful thing, right? And my husband has definitely acknowledged the fact that I I love to have something to worry about, that I yeah. can't just be content. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's definitely recognized it and, and he definitely appreciates, um, as he refers to it, you know, you've not been as mental in the last couple of years um and, and <laughs> i told you he was kind of um politically incorrect right but you know he he will say that to me and i guess yeah. i've got much better 
at not taking it out on him. Yeah. Right? He's, he is my buffer. He is my punching bag, not physically. Um, but, you know, if, if I'm having a crappy day or if I'm, you know, struggling with something, you know, guarantee you he's, he's the one that, that takes the brunt of it. Um, yeah. That manifests itself in just me being annoyed that, you yeah. know, he's been to the pub and he smells of beer or, you know, he's, he's, I don't know, been to the shop and, and bought the wrong milk or whatever it is. I can, I can, yeah. whatever's going on with me, I can find something so that it's his fault. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, and I guess we all do that, right? We all yeah. have that, person that we're safe enough with that that we can take it out on um and you know i i would at times through my own anxiety and not feeling content and you know all of the stuff that i i you know like he says i find stuff to worry about you know Mm -hmm. there are occasions when i would even question our relationship and just say well maybe the reason that i'm not content and i'm not happy is because our relationship isn't good and you know maybe we should separate and maybe like you know stop being stupid right go go to sleep you know you'll be fine in the morning um and you know i i guess all of this all of these memories and these conversations that we've had are, are coming back now that you're asking me the specific questions right <laughs> um so yeah hindsight's a really a really wonderful thing and i get I, over the last couple of years is been something that I've said quite a few times to some of my friends. It's like, why does nobody tell you this stuff? Why isn't there a book about this stuff? Mm. You know, the whole midlife crisis and the perimenopausal and the and the and the changes in your body and it becomes harder to lose weight or harder to not put on weight or the, this feeling of of discontent when you kind of reach your life goals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like there's no books about this. Nobody oh. talks about it. Nobody. It's not something your mom sits you down and and tells you about five years before it hits you, right? Yeah. Um, like we do, you know. I, I guess we all have that conversation with our kids when they go through puberty or whatever. But there's nobody yeah. that then has this conversation with people when they're about to hit forty. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I don't know whether I even answered your question there. I just rambled on. No, you did. You did. I, I, I just wanted to. That stuff that, I really that wanted to acknowledge you. No, no, I, I really want to acknowledge you. Uh, just listening to you, being really candid, really open, really honest, you know, uh, no sugar coating, and, and really sharing, you know, what, what your husband said, what you said. And I think it really resonates with people who are listening because that, this is real life. You know, this is not this perfect uh, book or perfect uh, theory or, you know here's a dot point follow this kind of thing and and what's important and what we talk about in let's talk is seeing those telltale signs in the in the first instance surely you 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 guys definitely saw the telltale signs um and what's important is to 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 talk about them now it's not always easy to talk about them you know in, in, in a perfect scenario uh, because there's a lot of emotion attached to those as well, uh, but it's it's really um, having the empathy, having that you know uh, detachment, almost connected still to to see the telltale signs and approach someone. And you know, people ask me how how do you see the telltale signs? So, well, you've been given two eyes, two ears, <laughs> you know, a heart to feel and a brain to to, to think and know. So use your use your faculties of sight, you know, see the telltale signs, hear them, feel them, and and approach that person. And you know, it's not perfect words to approach and start a conversation, but I always say if you have the right intent, if you have have the love and the care, you, you will say the right thing. Um, but I really want to acknowledge you for your honesty. Um, in, in, when we talk about acknowledging, and, and that's the first thing that when people open up. Uh, Emily, as you know, what we say, you know, the, that first <laughs> reaction or action uh, mm-hmm. when when you've heard a story uh, and and that reaction, and sometimes it's not easy to to um, to act with with empathy and gratitude because you've already had your little <laughs> uh, autopilot, you know, thinking of and and putting on on your on 
biases into it. Um, and a lot of people do that and that's normal almost. But I think acknowledging the person uh, is such a important part. Tell me, um, how easy was it for you to acknowledge that you were going through a midlife crisis? Firstly, personally, um, for yourself. I think what's really interesting for me is that I almost felt like I didn't have the right to have anything to complain about. You know, I, I have an amazing family. You know, um, I, I have amazing opportunities. I'm incredibly privileged and I'm so grateful for my privilege. Um, and so I, I, I felt and I still feel in some ways. Yeah. I don't have a right to have anything to complain about. Okay. <laughs> um, and even now I'm like, you know, why is Jessa having this conversation with me? Because my life is just like, so, you know, the, there's, there's nothing special that's happened to me or there's nothing different that's happened to me to everybody else. But I guess that is the point, right? This, what I have gone through, it, it's so normal and it doesn't matter whether you're in HR or sales or you're unemployed or you work in a supermarket. Um, it, it doesn't matter if you're male or female, whether you're a breadwinner, whether you've got savings in the bank, whether you're yeah. at home, right? whatever the reality of your life is and whatever the circumstances of your life, whatever they are, you have a right to feel discontent. Absolutely. Um, I think the big acknowledgement moment for me was um, I'm, I'm very, very grateful to have the most amazing mother-in-law. Um, not many people can say that, but I absolutely uh, adore my mother-in-law. And it's, it's really interesting because I'm incredibly close to my own mother and can have very open, candid conversations with my mom and my dad. And I can acknowledge any feelings or fears or concerns with them without you know, any issue at all. But my mother-in-law is this um, wonderful Swedish hippie. She lives in Wales. Um, She's, she's the most content person I've ever met in my life. This woman can, and she does, um, go to the park over, over the way she lives in Abergavenny, and, and she goes over to the park in her dressing gown and slippers with a cup of tea, and she'll video call me and just say, oh, I just wanted to show you this tree. You know, and, and she's the most content person. Anyway, she came to visit us in Singapore um, apart hey, Emily, from that's called living in the present moment. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. And I, and I, she's taught me so much and she came to visit. Um, I think it was either her first or second visit to Singapore. I mean, she'd yeah. never traveled other than backwards and forwards to Sweden and the UK. She'd never really traveled. Um, you know, we just, you know, tore away her, her grandchildren from her and so I guess our first gift to her was hey you know we're going to pay for your flight to Singapore come visit us she came here we took her to Marina Bay Sands we took her to Sate Street we took her to uh you know we've taken her on boat trips we we took her to Pula Ubin uh my husband took her up to Phuket on holiday you know we, yeah. we've blown her mind and I remember sitting with her in a cafe once here in Singapore and just saying like how how did you become so happy do you know like her her career after her boys, so my husband and, and uh, his brother, after the boys left, she's basically worked her career in an underwear store in Abu Dhabi. So if everybody, anybody's ever been to Abu Dhabi and bought pants or a bra, they've probably met my mother-in-law. Yeah. Um, she's worked there her entire working life. Um, totally content selling underwear. Uh, she has a little flat. She walks to her flat. She walks to the supermarket. Um, she, she, she's just incredible. And she's just happy. And like you said, Jessa, she, she's always in the moment. She's always in that moment. Mm. And I remember asking her how she does it. And there may have been a bit of wine involved in the conversation, but I remember her just saying, I've never had big aspirations. Like, I've never wanted to achieve really really great things so i've just never been disappointed mm. and that for me was a huge uh -huh moment. moment yeah 
well, I mean, expectation where you are. There's always as long as long as it's a big differential. There's always going to be uncertainty. You know, not feeling content. Yeah, exactly. And I guess you know the the aspirations you have then correlate in some way to the amount of anxiety you feel. Yeah. And the pressure I guess I put on myself by, you know, being a breadwinner, living overseas, you know, we don't have the same kind of family support network around us with, you know, my mom and dad and my mother-in-law are trained right away. Yeah. Um, you know, that that is an awful lot of pressure. Being a breadwinner, you know, I'm very grateful my, my husband now has a great job with a startup, but, you know, being that breadwinner and the pressure that puts upon myself and mm. the pressure of, oh my God, what if my kids don't like local school? What if I would have been better having them in, in the UK? Have my aspirations been too high? Yeah. And have I put too much pressure on myself? And is that causing my anxiety? And should yeah. I just have been content, you know? No. Should I just been a, been content with my lot and not wanted more? And has that yeah. actually created my anxiety? So that that conversation with my mother in law was yeah. a real moment for me. And I guess her her acceptance of the moment and also not necessarily striving for things or accolades or, or having these big life goals and achievement yeah. but actually what do you want to be and, and the big pivotal moment for me was going from what do i want to achieve and having my smart goals to what do i want to be known for right i now have children i have a daughter and a son that look up to me i i they're my legacy i guess right yeah what do i want them to think about me when i'm gone or when I'm old or, or when they're having to make decisions for themselves and, and thinking to, well, what, you know, what would, what would mommy do? Or what would mommy think is best? Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that pressure to be a good person and to have meaning and purpose and therefore the corporate life really has so much less significance. Yeah. And, and that whole change in wanting meaning and purpose rather than success, I think has been the big shift in me yeah. uh, as I've kind of gone through my early 40s. I, I don't know, even during this conversation, I'm like, I, I don't know, even know if it was a midlife crisis, um, but just that, that early yeah. 40s shift. <laughs> it's, I think it's redefining success for you, isn't it? Like, I mean, it's such a oh, point. Yeah. It's about, you know, it's about, you know, achieving this goal or that goal or whether it be economics or a position or whatever it is. But also you come to a point and go, I've ticked those boxes and, and hold on, what's my legacy? You know, what am I known for? What, what are people going to talk about me kind of thing? And I think it's more about shifting uh, your, your perception of success to something a bit different, you know, and, and we call it purpose and meaning, I guess. Um, but it's it's also accepting what you're feeling, and I, I I I can get the feeling, and you've been really honest about, you know, you still think I'm, you feel like you're complaining or what you should be, you know, kind of thing. And I think it's your journey. It's a wonderful journey, and the fact that you're talking about it and sharing about it, and I think your 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 gaps gonna get smaller and smaller to to a point. That doesn't mean you're sacrificing your goals. It's actually you're you're actually um, reframing things i guess yeah fantastic um emily listening is the the third strategy of the talk strategies or let's talk um listening is tough at the best of times <laughs> and and listening to ourselves how how what was your challenges about listening to yourself and even now even now listen to, to what your body's saying you talked about you know the phases you're going through physically and, and mentally, uh, what are your challenges listening to yourself through this journey? I guess um, for me, listening, listening, and, and we talked about this when we went through the Let's Pro, uh, Let's Talk program uh, with my current company. Uh, it's really hard to just listen 
and not want to fix it. Yeah. Right. And yep. even talking to my tribe, right? And oh my God, my, my, and they do tend to be girls, right? My tribe of girls um, that I have around me are an amazing and they listen, but we all try to fix each other. <laughs> we all have a solution. We all have a strategy. Sure. Um, and I guess that is then where it comes to, you know, um, the importance of maybe having a counselor or something because they're paid to just listen and they're trained to then not try to fix you. Yeah. Um, and, and allowing you the opportunity to just talk and, and work it out for yourself um you know and a little bit like i'm doing today right you're you're not trying to give me any suggestions or fix me or or, or tell me what to do um and and that's what going to a counselor gave me right i just the opportunity to to talk to a human being that sat in front of you but then not give you a response is actually really, really cathartic. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and we've talked about it through the program, right? It's just about emptying your cup. Absolutely. Just getting it all out there and sometimes saying it out loud. And, and like today, you know, and the, blowing the balloon. as we've been doing, you know, ju just getting it out there, you kind of then reflect, you know, you're, you're hearing. Yeah. My husband's throwing things in the background. Um, you're you're hearing the words that come out of your mouth so yeah. it, it, you then have time to process them and think about it um yeah so yeah that that listening thing the issue with listening for me is the other person responding yeah i, mean, yeah. And I do it i do it as well when i listen to people i can't help but Respond. share one of my experiences or try and empathize by telling them what i've been going through yeah um my I, I do it to my husband all the time you know if, if he wants to talk to me about something i'll give him a solution straight away um <laughs> and actually that's not what we need we need time to process um and and to come up with our own solutions because your own solutions are always so much better than solutions given to you by somebody else and they could give you an idea or or, or trigger or whatever but but yeah the reason why you know, going to a going to a counselor was good for me. Was that they they didn't try to fix me, and I thought they tried to fix me, which is why I put it off for so long. Um, but yeah, they they just listen and they go, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Emily, I've got I've got a, 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 I guess a different angle of looking at something. And you said they didn't try to fix me. Um, they were only trying to fix you if things broken. There's nothing broken, Emily. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's nothing broken, and and I think um, uh, what people because we're so pressured, uh, he, us human beings are so pressured to fall into a, a certain box, and as soon as we fall out of this box, something's broken. You know what I mean? And and what says that what you're feeling is absolutely hundred percent normal. You know, you know what says that if I've got a a bad back. Well, that's part of life. You know, it's got a bad knee. It's, it's a part of life. And uh, if you're feeling uh, the feelings you're going through and, and people who are listening to this at home, uh, if you're going through something like this, whether they call it midlife crisis or something else, you know, um, uh, it, it's not that it's broken. It's that this is how you're feeling. And it, it might need uh, some support. And listening, I guess, plays a huge part in that. And, and as you said so rightly, Emily, it's not about um, trying to fix it, but uh, getting that person to think about it so that they can't, can't, can't come up with their own solutions. And that's so, so much powerful, isn't it? Like to come up with your own, because you're in control of your, your life, not somebody else. Um, and we talk about listening uh, in the Let's Talk program. And and the, when when you actually get someone to talk about their feelings, what you do is help them to name them as well. You know, name those feelings so that it, it puts them into perspective. And I think our, our prefrontal cortex or our, our frontal brain, brains or thinking center really tries to process them when we start naming them. So by listening, you're actually allowing the other person to name what they're feeling. 
market, you know, and that's uh, that's that's in, in in a broad term what it does. Um, how how did your family listen to you? How how did your friends listen to you? How did you know? Looking back, did that help you, or were there times where they jumped in and and try to solve the issues? No, I um. Um, I, I guess I, I, I told obviously my family that, that I'd gone to see this counsellor. Um, I don't know, they didn't, I, I, I'm surprised they didn't really, thinking back, they didn't have a view. Um, there was no big deal about it. I, I, you know, I told my friends, my tribe, nobody, Nobody batted an eyelid, really. Um, hmm. Which I, yeah. Now you know, thinking back and, and reflecting, I'm a bit like, oh yeah, nobody really, nobody really had an opinion. Uh, you know, it was my friend that had, had suggested it obviously thought it was great that I I'd taken her advice. Um, my husband was just grateful that somebody else was now going to listen to me and he didn't have to. <laughs> um, <laughs> my, um, yeah, the, yeah, the, the was, there was no issue. I don't know whether I thought there might be. Um, were, you, were you concerned, like, to actually openly to say to your family or friends that I'm seeing a counselor? Do you remember the time when you sort of said that and were you sort yeah, of... Yeah, I, I guess everybody is concerned that there would be a, a you know, a, a yeah, stigma okay. or, oh, you have a problem. But, you know, honestly, like, what's the difference between going from your general practitioner to getting a referral to going and seeing a endocrinologist to going and seeing your gynecologist to going and seeing, you know, a psychologist, right? It's... They're all ists at the end. They're all medical professionals. <laughs> if you think about it, in, in most cases, and I'm grateful, it's kind of covered by our insurance. You know, so so that helps. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's kind of it's no different. It's just it's a different part of the body that that somebody is taking a look at. Yeah. Um, and and so I don't really know why I put it off for so long. I, I'm, I'm now actually questioning myself. Now you've got to ask me the question. I'm like, why did I leave it so long? Um, hey, Emily, why did you leave it so long? <laughs> I don't know. And, and hindsight's a wonderful thing, right? Um, uh, yeah, maybe, um, maybe the last few years would have been really different if I'd gone and done it sooner. I don't know. <laughs> What, what 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 do you think stopped you uh, going there? You know, maybe time. I mean, it, it was the same. You know, I I, I took a bit of a, a, a break from work a couple of years ago. Um, I I was doing a couple of other projects, and and, and part of this whole finding meaning and purpose. Yeah. Uh, so I had a project that finished. I had an opportunity to take a little bit of a break. I did some travel and um, set up my own consultancy business and, and, and worked on some smaller projects for a little while. Um, and I guess that gave me some time, mm. you know, and actually that time to then go for a doctor's appointment, go to the mm. endocrinologist and, and not be worried that my appointment would, you know, be missed because I was on a, a work trip or, um, yeah, I guess I guess prioritizing it. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm thinking about it. It's it's the it's we put off so much, and quite often the stuff that we put off is is the stuff that we think is the the least important or not so critical or you know will have the least impact or whatever. Um, and I guess I just deprioritize taking care of myself. That's such an important point you raise, Emily, uh, and we do that. I do that. I think we all do that, especially when it comes. You know, we look after our, our, our parents and our and our partners, you know, wives, husbands, and our kids. But sometimes we put ourselves 
to last here. Yeah? And um, I always look at that that saying, you know, put on your oxygen mask on first before helping others so that you can help them much oh, better. Oh, goodness. Yeah, and, and you know, looking back now, um, there was a conversation I had with a, with another member of my tribe, a, an Aussie friend. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, it, it was definitely a case of I was, I was deprioritizing taking care of myself. Um, that I, you know, like we talked about right at the beginning, you know, I'm, I'm a mother and I'm a daughter and I'm a friend and I'm a HR professional and I have my networks and I have all of these things going on. Yeah. And, and this, uh, this Aussie friend, another HR professional, another breadwinner. Again, I like to surround myself in people that can relate to me and relate yeah. to my circumstances. Yeah. I think that's really, really helped me. But this particular friend, she talks about the how life is kind of cyclical mm. and, and you can't be good at everything all of the time. You can't be a good mother at the same time as being a good, a, a good wife and a good friend and a good daughter and a good neighbor and a good employer. And, and you know what? Sometimes you just got to give yourself a break and allow yourself to fail at a couple of things. So that you can prioritize on other stuff mm. and i guess we've done that with our friendship you know yeah. our friendship is something you know we won't talk for weeks and then you know we'll get on one of our balconies normally hers or mine with a bottle of something nice um and and it's and it's like we haven't been away and we just catch up and it's because we've been focusing on our families or our careers or, or uh you know our husbands or whatever um and and she talks a lot about just giving yourself a break and allowing yourself to be bad at something while you focus on something else. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I think that the fact I'm even recalling it and that must be three years ago, we had that conversation. Um, the fact that I'm remembering it now means it definitely had a, a huge impact on me. Sure. Uh, and this is the thing, I, I picked up all these little things from, from what people have said to me and and certain things have stayed with me and I'm sure there's a whole bunch of stuff I've forgotten. Yeah. But, you know, people don't realize the amazing impact they can have on somebody else just by taking the time to listen to them and, mm. and, and acknowledge what they're going through and relating and not making them feel crazy or weird or yeah yeah or whatever um yeah. and and so i guess part of doing this as well is is not only to encourage other people to to find their tribe so find the people that get you yeah and find the people that have got time for you and find the yeah. people that give you energy but also then allow them to help you yeah you know That's a big allow one. Yeah. them to listen to you Absolutely. Um, is has has definitely been um, a huge part in me changing my aspirations becoming more content yeah um, changing from and i guess it's it's a personal branding thing as well right going yeah. from being somebody that is striving towards a thing or goals to actually striving towards being somebody that focuses on what they want to be known for. Yeah. And, you know, really concentrating more on, I guess, my whole brand. That, that time out was really interesting for me. And I know not, and again, it comes down to privilege, right? I'm very privileged that I'm in circumstances that meant I, I could take a bit of time off work when I yeah. needed it. And the timing was perfect. Uh, and it allowed me, I guess, to just sit and, and reflect and relax a little bit, but it also completely freaked me out because I lost my title, mm. right? I went from being able to introduce myself as, oh, hi, I'm Emily. I work for this particular tech firm and this is my job title. Yeah. And then I had to find another way to introduce myself. Yeah. yeah. I no longer had this title. And and we put so much emphasis on our job title. Yeah, yeah. And when and you don't have that, yeah. and when you don't have that, 
I suddenly realized, I guess, that I was a really boring person, right? I had, like, I had nothing to introduce myself as other than my job title. Yeah. And, and what's really, really helped me in terms of finding meaning and purpose and, you know, thinking more and, and working more on what I want to be known for rather than what I've achieved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, having that time out to, to experiment with things. You know, I tried volunteering at school, didn't enjoy it. Um, yeah. I got involved in a, in a charity. Uh, so I, I worked on the advisory panel uh, or, or an advisory group for, for a charity here in Singapore, which was great for me. I yeah. volunteered at the, uh, at the elections. I actually helped set up one of the polling centers here in Singapore last year. Um, you know, and, and kind of supported putting together the, the polling station and HDB. And, you know, that's something I would never do if I was consumed with my day job. Yeah. Um, I started doing training on General Assembly. Uh, so this General Assembly is a training organization and I, I give some of my time to support people in career transitions or early career uh, with their personal branding and their LinkedIn profile and, and networking skills and negotiation skills. And so I found all of these things now that actually give me meaning and purpose, which meant that when I found my next, I guess, you know, corporate gig. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this corporate gig really does. And the fact that we're, we're working with you on let's talk shows it's an organization that really, really kind of, cares about people and has good values and it's definitely aligned there was definitely a pull factor for me in terms of yeah. cultural fit yeah um but the fact that i also have all of this other stuff going on in my life means that my corporate life is no longer all consuming yeah and and actually there are things that mean i turn off my work phone and i can step away from stuff and i don't get as as stressed out and i'm not so focused on you know that adrenaline or looking for yeah, the yeah. crises at work right because i've got other stuff i'm now interested in and yeah. i'd maybe spend 15 to 18 years of my my corporate professional life only focusing on the day job and not having all of these other interesting things going on yeah um which which actually yeah, it just it, it made me very, very focused on just one thing. Um, and, and I realized I need to spread my wings a little bit and have yeah. more things that that give me meaning and purpose than just my day job. Yeah, it, it's it's just um, music to my ears <laughs> to listen to you, actually, because what you just described is um, the layers of change. And, and, and I think you've come to a point and uh, from, from what I'm gathering, and we talk about this, and let's talk about having an identity, which is driven by purpose. You know, really the purpose, it, that's the, the ground level, the ground zero, so to speak. It's understanding our purpose that drives our identity. Our identity drives our, our values and beliefs, and then which we then embrace, you know, what we learn, what, what we want to do in our life, and then create our behaviors and environment. So, uh, it, it sounds like, you know, you've really gone that, you're actually looking below the, the, the normal levels. And, and when you talk about branding, you're looking at, you know, your own identity and, and what you've discovered is other things. You know, it's not just about, about work, it, it's have, having that balance. And it's a wonderful journey uh, that you're going through, Emily. Um, and, and I think you're fortunate in the sense, as you said, you have a tribe already. And, and one of the things uh, we talk about Let's Talk is keep in touch is the K of, of the Let's Talk strategies. Keep in touch is about making sure that you have people around you uh, to support you. And, and sometimes uh, people don't. So, some, sometimes they feel that they can't uh, uh, keep in touch with their family or, or close friends or they're not ready to do that yet. Um, but there's so much other support services, you know, uh, you know, whether it be GP or a counselor or a call center, uh, wherever you're living, uh, you have a tribe. And, and it's, a, it's amazing that you have that uh, diversity of friends. Um, uh, you have the glass of wine, obviously, but, <laughs> and give you some advice, but you have people around you, which is amazing. Um, going forward, 
what's the most important support for you going forward? So it's it's definitely um, you know my kids, my parents, my husband. They are yeah. you know the the inner sanctum, right? Yeah. They're the they're the the close tribe. My mother in law is well included, um, and and we are a very open communicative family um, and and i'm very very grateful for that and even though my you know my mother-in-law is in wales and, and my parents are back in the uk you know there's always whatsapp chat going yeah. on and there's always conversations and my mom's very good at nagging me to get off whatsapp and actually go onto a call with her every now and again she's very good at that uh, so this is definitely you know that that's my inner sanctum my my tribe i guess it's interesting because it's a very transient tribe you know yeah. i live in singapore which is an incredibly transient environment especially in the expat community yeah um, i do focus a lot on ensuring that i have diversity of tribe i want yeah. diversity of viewpoint i have friends and members of my tribe from every cultural background you can think of you know mm -hmm. we were we were talking it about it recently at, at the we have a mahjong night the girls have a mahjong night every now and again not a lot of mahjong gets played but we have a mahjong night and we were talking about it and there was somebody from from uh from scandinavia there we had a couple of uh, local Indian uh, heritage or Indian ethnicity uh, ladies. We had um, a couple of Singaporeans, Taiwanese, uh, you know, Australian, New Zealanders. You yeah. know, it, it's, and when you look at the the diversity of my group, my tribe, uh, I'm I'm very very grateful for that. Yeah. And, you know, one of the reasons why I set up or with Sasha set up this breadwinning expat group was actually because the, the nature of the expat community is so transient. Yeah. Rather than having just one or two friends, it is nice to have this entire group mm. because just as people are leaving, there's other people coming in, yeah. right? And, and you can support the newcomers just as much as you stay in, in contact with the leavers. And obviously there's people within the community that I'm closer to on a personal level than, than others. But there's also a, an opportunity, and we have a little Facebook group. You know, you can just post on there, a friend of mine, uh, uh, a, a British lady, an expat, yeah. and a twin mom. She had a bit of a rant on there the other day and straight away the community have gone, right, okay, we need to get you out of your house. We're going for drinks on Thursday. Um, and, and so that's definitely my, you know, my, my lifeline. And there are people coming to those drinks that have never been to one of the, the, the breadwinning expat group yeah. drinks before. So there'll be people that know each other really, really well. And, and I've known that particular lady now for coming up to five years, I think. Yeah. Um, and yet there'll be other people that I've never met before. And yet we're all in the same circumstances where breadwinners, we're in expat. You know we're an expat in singapore so we get each other instantly we we have that immediate connection and so i think you know in, in terms of creating your tribe and finding your tribe it's finding things that you're truly interested in hmm. and you know i recently joined a book club <laughs> and i never thought i would be the type of person that joined a book club and oh my god i love it it's absolutely amazing. Like it's just a group of random women who I would have never met before, um, and and we meet, you know, once a month. We do it via Zoom, yeah. Um, and it, and it's incredible. And and yeah, we talk about the book. I normally I'm an audiobook listener, so, so yeah. that's me. yeah. I listen to my audiobooks, but just having that connection. That's exactly. With other what people that yeah. like the same stuff as you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's definitely the way forward for me and not it's, having all of my social network revolve around my work, finding authentic ways of meeting other people that have the same mm -hmm. interests as you that come from the same environment as you that get you. Yeah. Um, 
for me it's, it's definitely the the way forward it's really yeah cool. And that's that's exactly what keeping touch is all about is that connection and we're a communal species we're not meant to be alone you know a, a long long time is cool it's it's good uh, but really we need that connection and whether it be a book club or you know uh, anything else that uh, people get up to is to be connected that's such a that's a fundamental uh, human need for survival apart from you know air to breathe and water to drink and food to eat and and, and shelter connection is that that the fifth element for, for survival emily um last question uh I'm looking at the time i'm thinking we could sit here for another couple of hours and have a keep, keep talking about it <laughs> um what's your message to people who are watching you um who are going through this journey you know uh, whether we call it midlife crisis or, or a change that's happening to them and they're probably feeling like I've ticked the boxes, but you know, something's missing. You know, what's your message looking back from what you've learned? Um, so I'm just waiting for the birds to quiet down again. <laughs> okay. I'm, 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 I'm expecting a monkey to come up. <laughs> no, that's definitely a bird, not a monkey. Um, so, um, I think my advice would be to, to give yourself a break, right? Stop putting so much pressure on yourself. And I guess that's what I did. Yeah. Um, just take a moment, act, you know, allow yourself to reprioritize what's going yeah. on. Um, not everybody has the, the, the opportunity or the privilege to be in circumstances where they could maybe give up work for a few months or, or you know, do that, but, but just try and find a little bit of space to, to think or have the appointments or meet up with a friend or, or spend a bit of time with your, your parents or your kids or, or whoever it is that, that brings you joy. You know, I, I love the whole, um, there's been this kind of movement has, has it there about getting rid of all the clutter in your house, right? Sometimes we need to get rid of the clutter in our lives too. And it doesn't mean that that you you throw everybody away and you throw away your, your job and you throw away your interests, but, you know, prioritize, just decide. Put, put them to a side for a little bit and, and bring yeah. them back. Yeah, and, and, you know, going back to what my friend taught me or triggered in me was, you know, it's all cyclical, right? Just because you're, you say to your friends, do you know what, I, I, I can't do that this month, I, I need a little bit of space, your friends will still be there in a month, you know, if, if you know, you, if you have a hobby and you just need to stop it for a little while or, or whatever it is, you just need a little bit of space and in some ways and i, I do I, I joke about my midlife crisis actually got interrupted by the covid crisis um because actually isn't that what we've just been given and and i'm you know in in no way saying that covid has been a good thing mm. but it's actually given us an opportunity yeah right lockdown circuit breakers whatever they're called in 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 your particular area they have been really difficult for a lot of people they were difficult in some ways for for me too but it actually gave me a real opportunity to take a breath yeah you know the whole world has just taken a breath um which i've embraced mm. right um and do we need to go back to pre-COVID pace of travel and face-to-face -face meetings? And, you know, look how easily we've managed to connect. I've never met you face-to-face. -face. You've never even been in the same country at the same time. Yeah. Um, and yet you can build connection and trust um, in, a, in a really authentic, genuine mm. way. Yeah. Um, if if you give it the opportunity to 
to grow and develop. And so I guess my advice is just to take a breath um, and, and try and find that contentment. Try and find that tree to go and sit on the with your dressing gown and drink a cup of tea and take a photograph of it um you know and send it to your friends you know i i love the fact you know my friends will sometimes just message me going hey just checking in i'm like okay they don't need anything from me they're just checking in, Check in. They're just That's saying really hi important. yeah and you know sometimes they get a stupid emoji or a meme or you know last night a friend of mine sent me some weird ballads off spotify that she was listening to and she said hey i'm just sending these to you for no reason i'm like okay weirdo um but you know that's what that's what my tribe gives me just yeah. that check in no pressure there's no hassle i don't need to give them anything but i know they're there fantastic and it's not and as you said emily it's not just one person it's surrounding yourself with the tribe and definitely it's helped you it's definitely has kept you in, 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 a, in a space where you're going through some changes um, and it's it kept you going forward. It, it's because you've dived, dived in, you've dived in a little bit and, and to ask the, the why question, you know, what's my purpose kind of thing. And, and in that journey, um, the tribe has really, really helped you. So Emily, I, um, I just want to acknowledge you for your bravery for mm -hmm. coming out and really sharing with us very candidly your story uh, through um, what we call a uh, midlife crisis. <laughs> uh, maybe not a crisis, <laughs> well, you're here and you're still smiling. Um, and uh, it, it is important to acknowledge what you're going through. And uh, it is important for people who are listening out there to really acknowledge what they're going through, whether it be a midlife crisis or whether it be a concern, uh, whether it be you know feeling of sadness or anxiety or whatever it is it's so important to acknowledge and surround yourself with, with the tribe just like emily has and sometimes it's not easy to to get that tribe um you know and sometimes it's not easy to talk to your family and, and close friends and if you are in a situation where you are finding it difficult to, to find the people you trust to talk please reach out to you know to your gp to your your call center wherever you are uh, listening in, in your country. If you're definitely in Australia, please call uh, wonderful organizations like Lifeline, Beyond Blue, you know, Kids Helpline, uh, who can and will help you. So Emily, um, on that note, I just want to thank you once again for coming and joining and, and sharing your story. You know, um, your story is going to resonate with a lot of people out there who's going through something, a, a similar uh, situation. And also people uh, you know, their family and friends who are probably looking at, at their, their friends or their, their family and going, oh, they've gone through, they're going through a bit of a change here. What's going on with them? And I think, um, you know, you sharing a story would help them as well to, to help others, you know, and others they love. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening, Jeff. You're welcome. And guys, until our next Let's Talk Cafe, Keep talking.